Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is telescope alignment technologies. We're going to talk about some of the improvements that making or setting up a telescope uh, can have to make the uh, hobby of amateur astronomy more enjoyable. In the first part of uh, our program, though, we're going to review the three basic types of telescopes that are available for amateur astronomers. The first type is the kind that most people envision in their minds when you say telescope, and that would be the refractor. The refractor uses a lens at one end to focus the light and send it back down the tube. You can see here in the image how this works. The light is bent or refracted as it heads down to the focal point crosses over and then through the eyepiece on the straight through, as you see on the right-hand side. On the left, it shows a 45-degree diagonal that sends the light up at that 45-degree angle to make for easier viewing if you're looking at objects that are higher up in the sky. Again, this is the traditional type of telescopes that, telescope that uh, most people are used to seeing. And uh, it's great to use for uh, looking at planets and double stars, things like that, where you want to see some really fine, crisp detail. The second type of telescope would be the reflector, which uses a mirror, hence reflection in a mirror. We can see in this image that the light comes in from the left travels down the tube, hits the mirror, which is in the back of the telescope. Now, this mirror has a slight curve to it that sends the light back and starts to have it converge to the smaller secondary mirror that you see the little dark piece back up towards the front of the tube. That mirror is set at a 45 degree angle that sends the light up into the eyepiece where you can make the fine <coughs> focus adjustment to look at the object that you're viewing through the telescope. Uh, this type of telescope was first developed, or at least credited, to uh, Sir Isaac Newton, who made the reflecting type, to get around some of the problems that were inherent in refracting telescopes, those that used a lens, the main problem being uh, problems with color. Uh, all of the, the colors of the visible spectrum don't all converge or focus at the same point, and so you would have rings of color through some of these early refractors. This problem now has been uh, long taken care of. Our third type of telescope is sort of a combination of the first two. Uh, this example right here is known as a schmidt cassegrain telescope. It's similar in basic design to the reflector in that it has a mirror in the back, the spherical primary mirror that you see in the description there. But it also uses a corrector plate up front, which is kind of like a lens, if you will, to help with focusing the light. Now, once the light passes through that corrector plate and makes its way to the primary mirror, again, with that curve, the light is focused down, hits the secondary mirror, but instead of being set on an angle, this secondary mirror is parallel to the first mirror because the light is sent back through the primary mirror. There's a little hole in the center that the light goes through to the eyepiece, which is mounted behind the mirror. This type of telescope has several different type of configurations, not only a Schmidt Cassegrain. There's a Moxitoff Cassegrain where the uh, the corrector plate up front is sort of concaved rather than flat. 
And you can also find regular Cassegrain telescopes. Uh, you don't see them too much anymore, though, that do not have any corrector plate at all in front of the uh, spherical primary mirror. Now, these are the three basic types of telescopes. And of course, they can be on several different types of mounts. And it's the mounting and this new go-to technology that we're going to be talking about in the second part of this show. But right now, we're going to uh, take a quick break. If you have a, a question that you'd like to ask us, uh, please send us an email. We have the email address down there at the bottom of the screen. And uh, right now, we're going to go to term of the month with Stephen Weddy, and after that, we'll be back to talk about this new technology for telescopes. Thanks, Don. Term of the month for two, November 2015, Comet Lovejoy. Originally C 2014Q2, this was the brightest comet since the 1997 Hell Bop. Uh, ethyl alcohol was discovered. Uh, the comet delivers about 500 bottles per second. Uh, along with 20 tons of water, H2O, per second, and uh, also a simple sugar. Uh, a total of 21 organic chemicals were discovered in, but using, using the spectrum of the uh, chemicals uh, in microwaves. Uh, and that is term of the month for uh, November 2015, Comet Lovejoy. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. In this part of the show, we're going to be talking about some of the new alignment technologies that are available with today's scope. These technologies make setup, balance, and getting ready to observe quick and easy, or at least easier than it used to be. With me here to talk about these technologies is Liam Finn. Liam, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Don. The first scope we're going to talk about is this Celestron refractor. This is a basic type of telescope. It has basic technologies to it, but it can help the beginner who's getting started in the hobby of amateur astronomy. The basic motion of this scope is called ALT-AS, short for altitude azimuth. It moves in two basic directions, swinging around from left to right in a circular motion, and then up and down from the horizon to the zenith, which is the point overhead. It is battery powered, and you can control it with the use of the hand controller that comes supplied, and this helps you find any number of celestial objects. Now, it doesn't have a lot of the advanced features that we're going to be talking about in just a couple of minutes. Uh, you still would need your old level to make sure that the scope is flat and level to uh, aid in the alignment process. But even that, because it is such a basic telescope, uh, with the features it does have, uh, it's a nice scope to be able to start with. Next, we're going to move over to Liam's telescope, which uh, is a bit more involved. Liam, can you uh, tell our viewers about your scope, please? Certainly, Don. Um, this scope here is the Mead LX200R. Um, it is a alt telescope similar to this, but obviously far more advanced. Um, this telescope itself is a, is a refractor. Um, this telescope here is a, an SCT, a Schmidt Cassegrain, uh, which is a mixture between a refractor and a reflector telescope, which you described earlier on. Now, the one advantage of this, first of all, this is a 10 inch scope, which makes it really heavy. Uh, this would probably be approaching the limit <coughs> of a single person to carry at any one time. Um, the, but the nice thing about this scope is this, this version of the telescope actually comes with a GPS. So with this scope, you need to tell it the date and the time and where you are. With this one, it figures it out for you. There's a GPS unit sitting right here that actually audit, tracks the, with satellites, finds out the date, the time, your location, your altitude, and can actually calculate what it can and can't see from that position. Um, the other nice thing about this is it's similar to this in, with its uh, computer controlled, again, through a handset, but obviously this can run off some normal batteries, but generally you would not because for a, a night of observing, you would normally use a large, large battery. You could use a car battery. Um, in most places like, um, like Myers or any other store, you can buy the jump starter kits for cars that have the 12 volt round circular plug. 
Yes. That is what we use to actually drive these, a 12 volt battery. Now, this can be driven from the hand controller, uh, but the, one of the new the additional features that, that, are, that is new with these type of scope, excuse me, is we can actually link the scopes to a mobile device, which we, we discussed last week, um, our last show right. about our mobile device apps. Exactly. Uh, and one of them was actually Sky, Sky Safari and, um, and a few others. Well, Sky Safari has the ability through, for Android devices, we can link with this, this is called a Sky BT, Sky Bluetooth. And for, there's a Sky, uh, Sky uh, the Wi-Fi version of it is also available. Now the, the BT version, the Bluetooth version, is generally used with Android devices because not all Android devices can work um, with the, the wireless connectivity. So they have a Bluetooth version for the Android, which, is, with all, which pretty much always works. And um, they have the wireless version for the Apple devices. Now, the bonus of all of that is with your mobile device, let me just turn this on. As you see here, this mobile device is showing us uh, location right there that where the, the telescope is pointed. Now, if I select a new star and I hold it and I hit go to, because I've linked Sky Safari to my telescope, I can now drive my telescope. And I, let me just move it a small bit more. You can see it here that it's actually centering. Now, if I select another object to do a bit further, so you can see the, the motion, because that was very little motion. Okay, let me. And this is through apps that you can purchase for your wireless devices, yes. such as your tablet? Here we actually use a Sky Safari. So with Sky Safari, we can actually drive our telescope. Now, the, the, reason, the reason why this is really handy, a lot of people go out with sky charts and all this kind of stuff when they're observing, and that's really, really nice for a lot of people who go observing, but a lot of people, especially today, prefer to use technology, and they bring their, their tablet computer or their cell phone, and this can actually be linked via your cell phone for Bluetooth, or add to your tablet computer, and you have your whole sky map on your tablet computer, and you can drive your scope from it also. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's really, really nice. Um, you can do an awful lot, and you should, the Sky Safari is a really nice app, so you don't have to carry sky charts and try and track new objects. Sky Safari, because you can do an update on, on wireless at home before you go observing. Uh, with Sky Safari, you have all the latest and greatest objects out there. So if there's a new comet out there, if you want to track satellites or anything like that, it actually shows them real time. And they capture, you can do updates on a daily basis once you start the app. This is great. I know, we, as we said, we talked about this last month with the apps themselves. But now this is great to really see the practical application of what these apps can do yep. with the newer technologies that are available on some of these telescopes. Yes, it is fantastic what you can do. And it, and you, it's integrates with all of your present electronic devices that you have today. Anything other that we would like to uh, um, talk about with the newer technologies with uh, this particular scope? Well, there are, there are various versions of the scope, um, such as um, the light switch version of the scope. Uh, and light switch version of the scope has a built-in camera on them. And with the light switch, what it actually does is when you do an alignment of the telescope, it actually, the telescope slews to the position where, where the object's supposed to be. The camera takes a picture, and then the software in the, in the, the uh, telescope analyzes that picture to make sure it's the right object. And when it finds the right object, it actually centers on that object using its own built-in camera. So normally with a telescope, when you slew to an object, you're always off a small bit. You have to adjust a little bit. Sure. The light switch technology actually fixes that and corrects that for you. Because yeah. it, it self-centers by taking images. Back in the day, we would look through the viewfinder and then look in the eyepiece and then have to make the appropriate tweaks to yeah. uh, make sure that we had our uh, object that we wanted in the scope, but it sounds like there's some recognition software. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, it actually looks for the star patterns, and it, it, so it knows what star should be around it, and it takes a, a, a maybe 10 or 15 second exposure, and then analyzes the exposure to look for the, the star patterns in that area, and it uses that to center your scope. So even if these stars are fainter than the star you're looking for, uh, it will be able to recognize it? Will, yeah, it does. Now, obviously in a light polluted area, that actually becomes really difficult for a light switch type of technology, but in darker skies, light switch, uh, light switch technology is fantastic. Now, 
What types of scopes come with this light switch technology? Have any information? Generally, they come with the with um, the SCT style, and there is um, uh, there are some versions of the um, of the. Uh, Dobsonian, the Newtonian style telescopes, the smaller versions of them, okay. they actually come with that as well. But it does increase the price because you're adding that additional technology and exactly. the recognition software and so on is being added to your scope. So that would actually work with the old push to technology of a Dobsonian no, reflector? No, no, that's only on a go to. You cannot, because it has to drive the computer to control where the scope is pointing. So these types of Dobbs then would have a drive mechanism? Yes, they are, they are, they are go to scopes, which is what we're, roughly what we're describing in some of these here. Exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, I know Celestron and some of their higher end telescopes have Nexstar technology where you can make an alignment on one or two stars and it also has some leveling features in it that it will sense where it is to level itself out mm -hmm. in that GPS feature itself. So Mead isn't the only one that has this particular technology. No, it's become commonplace now when you, when you go to the higher end um, technology in the scopes, they, they come with all of these features. Um, again, the light switch is, is not very common, but it is out there. Um, the, the next star, similar to the next start, the, the GPS and the self-leveling, all of, mo most of the telescopes come with that, especially s something similar to this all will come with it, whereas a smaller unit like this will not have that technology built in. No, well, you're not paying for it. Exactly, you get what you pay for, so. <laughs> now, we were talking about the push to Dobbs. Those are the traditional where you just move it and you do a little star hopping. Mm -hmm. Now, Orion Telescopes has a uh, technology called Intelescope Object Locator. And uh, this particular technology, you load into this little computer box, if you will, it's about so big, mm -hmm. and uh, it comes up with the coordinates. And then what you do is you push the scope in the two directions that the scope does, altitude and azimuth, and when that box readout says zero, you are on that object. Now, you do have to tell it where it is. You have to encode it with date and time. It doesn't have the GPS feature that we were talking about a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. but you brought something along with you that's similar to the Intelescope. Correct. Well, the Intelescope actually comes, as you said, it comes with the push to. It is actually possible to take your existing telescope and make it a push to. Um, there is uh, items such as this, which is called a digital setting circle. This actually has 4,000 points that it registers in the circle. And you can get higher resolution ones that okay. do up to 10,000. Um, what it does is you have two of them. One goes on the, your, your, on the base of your scope to, to de de detect your, your motion left and right, your, your azimuth. And then the other one goes on the side, which detects your altitude. And by using a combination of these, um, which are linked then, to a box like this. This is actually called a Sky Commander. It's, uh, I use it on one of my scopes, my Dobsonians. Okay. And by linking these to this, this acts like, acts like the telescope that you were describing, whereas you, give, you tell it the date and, the, the date of, and um, location where you are, and once you have that done, it asks you for a two-star alignment, so you pick two bright objects in the, in the sky to align to, and after that, you choose an option that you want from the menu, press Enter, and it gives you two digital readouts, one for altitude, one for azimuth, and once you zero, by, by turning and tilting your scope, once they zero out, your target is actually right on spot. So this is an aftermarket version of Orion's in telescope. Yeah, it's a, di well, it's a, it's a different uh, manufacturer, actually. It, um, it's, I, mean, I suppose aftermarket would be a good description, but it, it gives you the ability to add it to any type of telescope. That you, if you, and if you decide to build your own, you can actually include this in the construction of your own scope as well, if you wish to. Now, another way to help find objects in the night sky is some technology that's been around well, for about eight, ten years mm -hmm. is the, uh, the Sky Scout. Uh, this one is by Celestron. Correct. Well, the Sky Scout is really nice for anyone. You can actually buy a Sky Scout if you just want to go observing the night sky and find constellations. You can actually choose the constellation you want to find here. And by actually looking through, through here and actually looking through the Sky Scout, there are actually lights appear on the inside telling you which direction to turn your Sky, your sky Scout. And, by, and once you've, you're on target, all the lights around the edge of it light up. So you're actually looking at the object you want. Now, you can actually get this also that actually goes on to a telescope. And once you actually mount it on the telescope, you can actually use this as a push to. Because you, have, you set it up and you align it on your telescope, 
choose the object you want and by looking through here and, and slewing your scope, you can turn any telescope into a push tube by using similar so technology. So you're using this sort of as, as a finder or a, a tell rad? For instance, yes, yeah. yes, it acts in the same manner. The, the nice thing, the, 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 the one thing I like about it, I like this is it can attach to almost any scope if you wish to use something like this. It does have a full menu so you can choose the objects. It even has, if with a headset, you can actually turn around and talk to it. Or sorry, it'll talk to you and tell you what you're looking at and give you a full description about what you're seeing as well. So if you have a smaller scope and it looks like a small little fuzzy object, they're actually telling you what you're seeing. Um, whereas on a larger scope, you're obviously going to see a lot more detail, but this can be added to pretty much anything. And there's other similar ones, that are, there are other technologies similar to this out there that can do the same, a lot cheaper than buying this. Uh, the, the Sky Commander, which is the one I showed you, with its um, encoders is about maybe $500. Okay. You can buy this for, for less than two, and it can go onto any, any type of telescope. And it's, it's an easy mount. You buy an adapter, you mount it on your scope, and now you have a push to. And you could leave it off and use it at uh, star parties or outreach events, going to schools Correct. or for scouts. And each one of them can uh, take their turn looking through at uh, various objects. Yeah, and this has a built-in GPS, so you don't have to tell it where you are or the time or date. Once you're outdoors, not inside, and you turn it on, it will automatically do a GPS fix for you. So it knows where you are, it knows the time and the date, and then you just have to choose the object you want from the menu and go there. And with the headphones, as I said, it will actually tell you what you're looking at. Well, I think some of this technology that's available today versus when uh, we started back in the hobby, it uh, really makes it, I, I think, a lot easier for people who were thinking, well, I'd really like to do this, but that looks more difficult than I think I can handle. And this seems to solve that problem. Especially for beginners. Um, once you get in, used to doing into astronomy for a while, you, you learn where stuff is in the night sky, so it's not as difficult. But as, as a beginner, it can be hard finding stuff because with the naked eye, we can see so little. And with a telescope, we can see so much, but the view is so narrow that having something like this to aid you and to point you at least in the right direction will help you along the way. That and a good book that will explain what you're supposed to be seeing. That and maybe joining an astronomy club. Joining a club is always the best way to learn. That's how I learned. Because you've got all those people around, especially if you're a newbie, uh, they most likely know more than you do at the point where you're at, and you can gain from their experience and expertise to be able to step into some basic equipment and some basic technology and then uh, move their way up to uh, something like you have uh, behind you over there. We all, we, we, aperture is all, what we all want. We always aim for bigger and better scopes. Sometimes our pocket doesn't allow us, but it's our aim. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Well, I hope that uh, you've all enjoyed uh, this discussion on some of the new technology available on telescopes to make their use easier and more enjoyable in the long run, spending more time observing and not setting up. Uh, I'd like to thank Liam for uh, being on the show to uh, talk with all of you uh, about this particular topic. Uh, if you'd like to see uh, more of our uh, episodes, you can go on to uh, YouTube and uh, find those there. Also, you can go to the Ford Astronomy Club slash AFE, uh, HTML, and uh, it'll take you to those shows as well. Coming up next, we'll have Stephen Witte with What's Up in the Night Sky. Stephen? What's up in the night sky for November 2015? Uh, daylight savings time changes in the United States on November 1st. So we didn't have a big change in October. We don't have a big change in November. In, um, uh, in the US, daylight savings happens on the first Sunday of the month. It just happens that the first is a Sunday. And the sun rises at 7.06 AM at the beginning of the month. We're still going toward the uh, winter solstice, so the days are still getting shorter. So by the end of the month, 
the, uh, the sun rises later at 741, uh, 7.41 in the morning, and it also sets earlier by the end of the month, uh, going from almost 5.30 p.m. to about, about 5 p.m. At the beginning of the month, on November 3rd, we have the third quarter moon. On the 11th, we have the new moon, so not much moon there. On the 19th, we have the first quarter, and then finally, we have uh, the full moon on the 25th. Now, we probably can't see Mercury even at the very beginning of the month, but this is a shot on the first of the month uh, at uh, 6.23 in the morning. You can see that the sun is rising. It may actually drown out Mercury, which is at minus one magnitude. It's pretty bright. Spica, which is right nearby, is plus one magnitude, so it's two magnitudes dimmer. You might not be able to see that either. But above, the, above Mercury, or above where the sun is going to rise, you have Mars very close to Venus and, uh, and very close to Jupiter. Jupiter is right on top there. So Venus rises around uh, 3.10 in the morning, and uh, by the end of the month, 4 in the morning. Mars rises at 3.12 in the morning, and at the end of the month, at um, 10 minutes to 3. And Jupiter starts uh, rising at about 10 after 2, and by the end of the month, uh, rises near 1. Saturn, if it's visible at all, is only visible at the very beginning of the month. Uh, Saturn undergoes superior conjunction on November 29th. That's when Saturn is on the absolute opposite side of the Sun uh, from the Earth, so you, it won't be visible at all here. So you can see one of the red lines is, uh, is the orbit of Saturn. Uh, uh, there are two other sets of lines uh, for Uranus and Neptune. And speaking of Uranus and Neptune, uh, these are really nighttime sort of objects. Um, uh, uh, Uranus sets at 520, or these are really morning objects. Uranus sets at 520 in the morning uh, at the beginning of the month, and then 320 by the end of the month. Neptune sets at um, 2 in the morning, and then by the end of the month it sets at about midnight. Uh, they're not as close to each other. It's not easy to tell in this shot, but they're not as close to it. They seem to be getting farther apart. And since these planets move so slowly in the sky, they seem like, oh, they've always been, you know, like Neptune has always been in Aquarius, as far as I can remember, right? Uranus has always been in Pisces. It's not really true, but it's, um, it's kind of true. And Vesta, um, is a great uh, uh, binocular uh, asteroid. Yeah. So um, we, we've got the, the great Leonid meteor shower on the 17th. Uh, it's something to really warm, uh, get dressed up warm and uh, look up in the night sky because that's the great free show that we have overhead every night. Thanks.